Welcome, everybody. My name is Shannon Sarna. I am um, editor of The Nosher, which is part of 70 Faces Media. Tonight's event and all of our live events are part of My Jewish Learning's The Hub. So if you like joining together as part of a community and learning, we have events going on all the time. I'll share The Hub's website in our chat box and feel free to check out um, all of the wonderful offerings that they have, like synagogue tours from around the world, daily minyanim, everything, cooking classes, conversations. Um, tonight, we are really, really lucky that um, we are going to be learning with Jennifer Abadi tonight and for the next two Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Jennifer is really like a seriously veteran cooking instructor is the only way I can explain it. She teaches at so very many very, very well-respected places at the Institute of Culinary Education in New York City, the Jewish Community Center of Manhattan, which is an amazing facility if you've never been in person. She is the author of two cookbooks, A Fistful of Lentils, Syrian Jewish Recipes from Grandma Fritzi's Kitchen. Um, and um, what, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting <laughs> the name of your other cookbook. Um, Too Good to Pass Over. And the Pat, right. And her Passover. Too Good to Pass Over, yes. I will share both the links of those in, um, in our chat as well. So I just want to welcome Jennifer. I've been a longtime admirer of hers and um, I'm excited to learn from her tonight with all of you. Uh, so again, the chat is open. Feel free to ask your questions for Jennifer there. And without further ado, I am going to hand this over to her um, and take it away. I will be quiet now. Thank you so much, Shannon, for all that great introduction. Um, good evening, everybody. And I know for some of you who are all the way in the West Coast, it's still the afternoon, so welcome. Um, as Shannon mentioned, I'm beaming in from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. That's where I am right now. That's where I grew up. And just to give a very quick introduction of my background so you can understand where I'm coming from, and then we'll get right into the recipe. Um, I am half Ashkenaz and half Sephardi, or even Mizrahi, depending on how you define it. Um, one side of my family comes from Riga in Latvia, and the other side comes from Syria. So as you can see, two vastly different uh, communities in the Jewish world. But I grew up with all the Syrian um, traditions, customs, um, foods, of course, and the culture. Um, so I grew up with Syria, and that's how I wrote my first cookbook, A Fistful of Lentils, which is a compilation of recipes and stories from my family and the Syrian Jewish community, which is mainly in Brooklyn here, although they've spread out into some other parts of the country and even in uh, Mexico and South America. Um, and then my second cookbook, Too Good to Pass Over, is even though it is a Passover cookbook of 23 communities um, in the Mizrahi, Sephardic, and Judeo-Arabic uh, world, um, it is actually more than just Passover, uh, which is why I also call it too good to pass over because the recipes, except for a few that are with matzah, most of them are just great recipes um, from all of North Africa, including Ethiopia, the Mediterranean, Middle East, uh, Iran, and so on, um, and how they prepare for Pesach, but the recipes you can prepare all year round, their traditions, their rituals, and their memories of preparing for Passover. So the reason I mention that is because my, um, what I really focus on um, and dedicate all my time, most of my time to in not only recipe writing and cookbook writing and teaching is all Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, Central Asian and North African cooking and culture. And in addition to the actual recipes that I love and my favorite foods, um, my real goal is to preserve recipes from being lost in the generations um, as each generation comes because people change in how they eat and also as people move and immigrate. And as we know in the Jewish uh, world and community, Jews are constantly moving back and forth into different places. So I try to not only do what I did for my family, which is the Syrian world, but do for all the other uh, Jewish communities um, uh, what uh, write their recipes down, their memories, their stories, and give context. So today's recipe that we're doing today is one of, uh, it's a Persian recipe. Um, you might have heard of it. It's called Basinjan, or you can call it Basinjun. It's different kinds of uh, accents, depending on where in Iran, which is a very big country. And this particular dish comes from the category of what they call Horesht, 
or koresh, which are the stews, different kinds of stews, right? So this particular stew, um, Pesinjan, um, comes from the more northern, slightly western part of Iran, um, which is the Gilan province of Iran, near just along the coast, of it, just along the Caspian Sea. Um, and what's particularly interesting about it is it's a dish that has, um, that we're doing with chicken today. So it's a, a poultry dish, although you can do it, I've read, with uh, lamb and ground meat as well. But supposedly the original dish coming from this region used duck and not chicken, but um, because there, were, there was many kinds of duck that uh, lived there. Um, so it was a recipe using duck. And the other thing that's very important to um, sort of, as we go through the ingredients, is the use of two things. Um, the pomegranate juice, um, which is a sweet tart flavor, right? It's very acidic, but it has a very sour tart sweet balance and the use of walnuts. And um, so this dish is also something that is traditionally served um, during something called Yalda night, which is a holiday or celebration for the Northern, Northern Hemisphere's winter uh, solstice. So basically about the 20th of December, 21st of December, around there, it's, it's one of the dishes that it might be served um, to celebrate the longest night, um, the longest uh, night of the year. Okay, so that's just one interesting, and that, during that occasion, they serve a lot of fruit and nuts. And so this dish has those two ingredients in there. Um, so what I'm going to do now is show you my ingredients in front of me and then we're going to get right into the cooking. So of course the base here is the chicken. I prefer using uh, a mix of dark and white meat. A lot of traditional cooking uses a mix of dark and light um, just because the dark meat is actually where you have a lot of the flavor because it has the, um, the blood that used to be in there um, and more fat. Um, and you'll see that I have lemons in here. And this is actually something that I learned in the Ethiopian uh, Doro Wat recipe that I worked on for my book. Um, and it's used in, traditionally, you soak your uh, chicken. Um, you don't have to, but you can soak your chicken in ice water with lemon rinds. Um, you squeeze the lemon and that helps to um, not only kill excess bacteria, which is why it was done very traditionally um, back in Ethiopia, but also um, helps to neutralize any, any kind of flavor you might have from the chicken. Then we have um, the walnuts that I mentioned, which we're going to quickly toast in a small um, frying pan. Uh, onions, of course, we're going to um, fry up and cook as part of the sauce. And then the spicing is pretty simple. But we have two kinds of paprika. You can use just one. I like with a, a little bit of smoked and then sweet. You can also do a little bit of hot. You can use any kind of paprika you want. You can also use just sweet and not smoked, but I like this combination of both. Um, cinnamon, which gives a little bit of an earthy sweetness and balances the uh, tart um, fruit flavor of the pomegranate. And then just salt and black pepper. You can also use white pepper if you um, have that instead. And then the brown sugar is just the balance the flavor of the uh, sauce so that it's not too sour and tart. You have to do that to taste. And then over here, <clears throat> this is just the sauce uh, portion. We have some tomato paste that we're going to um, dissolve in some cold water. And then we have lime juice here, um, freshly squeezed. And then here is the pomegranate juice. And just, um, you know, I've done this recipe many times, and I found that if for some reason you cannot find pomegranate juice, which these days it's actually pretty easy to find, cranberry juice works really, really well in place of the um, pomegranate. So you can do that. It just might have to balance your sugar uh, amount a little bit more, but it actually translates really well. So I think that's a great way of sort of introducing an ingredient that's very uh, American. <clears throat> but still within the realm of the Persian cooking, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do here is bring you over to my um, small frying pan, and I'm going to just raise the temperature a little bit. You see I have like a medium-high temperature. Hey, Jennifer, we have one quick question. Uh, yeah. What can we substitute for tomato paste uh, if we're allergic? That's a question from my friend Eva. Oh, allergic to tomatoes? Uh, yes, uh, I assume so, yeah. Yeah, I would just then leave it out because I'm not sure. Um, let me think about that. 
okay? Because I, obviously if you're allergic, you have to leave out any tomato product. I was gonna, I was gonna suggest maybe something that's with a different kind of tomato, but I guess that wouldn't work. I would just leave it out. It will affect the flavor a little bit, <clears throat> but the main thing is to have um, the fruit the, the pomegranate juice, okay, or the cranberry. So that's the main thing to have. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just heating up some vegetable oil, just a simple oil, not, not a lot of olive oil in this case, and especially with cooking. I know a lot of people think that anything that's Eastern is olive oil, but actually even my grandmother didn't use a lot of uh, olive oil when it came to cooking. That was more for um, fresh flavoring. And now I'm just going to put, this is just finely ground walnuts, it hasn't been toasted or anything, um, that I <clears throat> ground in my food processor. And then I'm going to put into my skillet here. And we're not really cooking it till it gets really, really dark, but we're, we're just giving it a little bit of a pre-cook, almost browning slash frying it in this oil, okay? Now, you have to keep your eye on it because it will seem like nothing's happening at the beginning, but then it can burn very easily nuts. Um, so you can't lose sight of it, all right? And a lot of cooking is about balancing your time and doing a lot at the same time, keeping track of things, working on something else while another part is cooking or sitting, right? So you have to just make sure that you keep track and you don't lose sight of what you're doing. While this is happening, I am going to now start to brown in my saucepan here, my large saucepan here, um, the uh, chicken, okay? So I'm just putting on a high heat, as you can see here. One more, one going... more question, Jennifer. Yeah, um, sure. Is the ground walnuts, did you measure them before grinding them or after? Okay, so that's a good question just in terms of recipe reading. When I say one and a quarter cups walnuts, and then I say fresh, uh, finely ground, that means you measure the one and a quarter cups first, and then you finely grind them right? If I had said one and a quarter cups finely ground walnuts, then that would be already finely ground, right? That's sort of like just in terms of recipe reading the way it's done. But that was a great question. Thank you for that. Okay, so now we've got the walnuts that are working on here. And I'm just warming up a little bit of the oil here. It's, it's a few tablespoons, four to five. It's a good amount. Um, notice also my chicken I have done two things. One is the breasts were very large because I got like a cut up chicken pieces. Um, so I cut the breast in half. I also skin them. I didn't skin the, um, the drumsticks because that's fine. A little skin is good. And uh, I think on the drumsticks is fine, but I take off the excess of the fat. It will not brown as well if you take off the skin, but that's okay because we're not fully cooking it. We're just browning. So now I'm just putting it in the oil. And you can hear a little bit of a sizzle, okay? I'm putting this side down first, and it's just enough to sear the outside. Uh, some people feel like that if you do it that way, it keeps them from drying out and a little more moist and juicy uh, when you cook it. Because you do have to cook it for a while. A lot of these dishes are about cooking for a long time, right? So they get nice and soft, but also the meat is falling off the bone. I'm just washing my hands right now because I was handling the chicken. Okay. Um, and then you get a great gravy from the fact that you're cooking the chicken. All right, notice you can't smell my nuts right now, but if you are cooking nuts, you might want to make sure you're not, your nuts are not burning. I can smell them and I can see a little bit of browning underneath. This is good. I am turning it off the heat and I am letting it cool until I'm ready to use it, okay? That's all we need. And when you smell it, that's a great indicator, okay? So now my sure, chicken- we have, um, we have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, can you use boneless, skinless breasts and thighs instead of leaving skin on them? Yes, so you beat me to it. I was actually just going to mention that because I know a lot of people, you know, it's funny. I feel like over the last 10 years, it's harder to find chicken on the bone in the store. It's almost like everything is boneless and breast, <laughs> even the thighs. So what I would say is the, the amount of chicken um, that I mentioned here, um, 
is more uh, with the bone in, okay? So you might not need as much chicken, but if you get boneless, I would say, try to do at least a mix of thighs and white meat or just thighs and just keep it to thighs. You could even do chick, I've done this with just chicken uh, drumsticks or whole legs. I think this is a great dish for just doing the chicken legs on the bone. If you do boneless, then try maybe just doing just the chicken thigh, if you're okay with that. If you prefer having a mix of white and dark meat, then try to mix it, you know, if you, if you really want the light meat. And you can put them in portion sizes, you know what I mean? Like, not so big so that when you serve it, you don't have to cut it because you don't want giant pieces of meat and then people have a giant piece of meat in their plate, right? So, and I'm just using these tongs here to more easily pick them up and move them around. It's still on a high heat, right? And I'm just trying to cook them a little bit, give them a little time to cook. And the next thing we're going to do after um, we brown these onions a bit is, I mean, these uh, chicken pieces a bit, is we're going to add the onions. So you want to have your onions ready next, um, and then your spices, okay? And the last thing we're going to add are the liquid portion. And I just have some coriander leaves here that I like to throw in as well. I know some people don't like them. They are either allergic or they say they're allergic. They hate the taste. It tastes like soap. I happen to love it. If you don't like coriander leaves, you can use uh, Italian parsley, the flat leaf parsley. That's totally fine. A little green is nice, if not putting at least in the stew, uh, serving so that it freshens it up. It gives a little color uh, to the dark sort of reddish brown color that you'll see in the, in the stew. Um, so Jennifer, we, we actually have yeah. a, a bunch of questions about nuts. So we have a lot of questions about, could you replace the nuts with another nut? Could you replace it with almonds or a Brazil nut if you're at a walnut allergy? And then the other uh -huh. question is, if you're allergic to all nuts, is there something else that you would recommend substituting? Um, so in terms of if you're specifically allergic to walnuts, I mean, this is about walnuts, this dish but you can eat other nuts. I would say you can substitute, those are good suggestions, like hazelnuts has a nice sort of, has a flavor to it, a little, little bit maybe sweeter, um, but hazelnuts are good. Uh, you can use, I think almonds, like raw uh, almonds, not the blanched kind, but the whole raw almond that, you know, with the thin skin on the outside. Uh, has a little bit more of a bitter flavor, so I could you could use that. Um, you know, you, you, the truth is you don't really taste the walnuts so much once the stew is cooked, but it does add texture and um, a, a slight flavor that you may not realize as walnuts if you didn't know they were in there. Okay. What if about can't, what cashews? Um, Cashews are very different, actually, right? Because those are what the stem of a cashew that you get in like Brazil. Um, the texture is much softer, but if you can do that, you can. I think the texture, it would make it more possibly creamy, um, mm. but I think it's fine. Yeah, if that's fine, if you are not allergic to that, I'm also trying to think of whether seeds would be Oh, that's interesting. Uh, like, like a pumpkin. yeah, if you can eat seeds, right? I'm thinking if you can actually eat seeds and not nuts. Uh, what seeds might be something that you would use? I'm gonna actually look. I keep my seeds and nuts in my freezer right here, and I'm wondering if pistachios would be uh, pecans. Mm. I wouldn't use peanuts. That's a whole different thing. And people are allergic to that anyway, a lot of them. I would say try pecans, but that may not work either. Um, and if you have to leave them out, you have to leave them out, right? Um, but you can still do a nice sauce. You know, the Syrians, we have a dish uh, that's with uh, sour cherries. We cook a sweet sour dish with sour cherries, um, which is, to me, always 
this dish reminded me of that Syrian dish. And it's not so much that it's a coincidence. There really is a lot of sharing and there are some similarities between Persian cooking and, and Syrian cooking and also Turkish cooking. Um, and there's a lot of borrowing from the Persian empire um, into Turkey especially, but also in Syria, which was along the spice routes um, and benefited a lot from ingredients coming from the East and Asia. So we do with sour cherries and we do not put any nuts in it at all. To me, this is very much something you would see in Afghanistan, uh, maybe Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, the stands, right, and Iran, okay? So you could do it without nuts at all um, and have a nice sauce and it would just be, maybe you would just need to cook it a little longer to get a little nicer gravy, but that's it. So you can definitely do it and make your version of the sesame done. Okay, so my, you'll see that my chicken is not so much brown, but it is seared. So what I'm going to do now is, you see I have a plate here. I'm actually just going to remove the chicken pieces temporarily. Okay, this is so I can make room for my onions that are going to now cook in the, um, the juices of the chicken, right? Because you want to use all that great fat that, even though it's not a lot, there is more than enough. If there wasn't enough because you used all skinless, boneless, and white meat, then you'll probably need to add a little vegetable oil to compensate, okay? Because you want it to be coated pretty well. Um, this is maybe, I would say, about a quarter cup's worth for the amount of onions that I'm putting in. And now I'm just putting in my chopped onions. You can use white onion, yellow onion. Um, what we're trying to do now is not so much brown the onions as much as cook them until they're soft and transparent, okay? That's what we're trying to do here. Um, and this is where you get a lot of the flavor um, in the Persian stews, also Syrian cooking, always starting with chop and onion. And I remember once somebody wrote to me when my book came out and she said, Jennifer, you know, you always say, um, you know, every recipe you have starts with chop and onion. And I don't know how to chop an onion. So it's like difficult to even get started, you know. But the truth is that a lot of these recipes, they rely on onions a lot for flavor, right? And in this recipe, actually, you don't even have garlic. It's just onions. But it's more than enough to give a nice base of flavor. So now I'm just cooking these onions until they get a little bit soft, OK? And then um, once they get a little softer, I'm going to add back in my, my browned um, walnuts that I already cooked. And then I'm also going to add in my spices. So if you're cooking along with me, you should have ready your um, two paprikas or one paprika, depending on how much. I would though compensate if you're only using the sweet paprika, then use a little extra of it if you're leaving out the smoke. Um, I like to use kosher salt. A lot of the great big chefs like to use kosher salt, mainly because it doesn't impart any particular flavor. It's very neutral and it's the texture. It has sort of this flakiness to it that supposedly breaks down very well in sauces and foods. Brown sugar will add a little bit after because I want to actually taste to see how the balance is of sweetness. And then pepper and then the cinnamon, okay? So these are the main things you should have at the, at the ready. Um, and I would say that my onions are in good shape right now. For me to now add back in, my toasted walnuts, okay, put it all in there. Mix it up. And if you feel that, you know, there's not enough oil in here, the way I always say, oh, I'm gonna reduce also my temperature a little bit right now to a medium, medium high, just so that I don't burn too much the uh, walnuts. I'm just cooking it mixing it up and you see it really soaked up a lot of the oil so now it's pretty dry in the middle of the pan but that's okay because what we're going to do is we're going to in a minute add the chicken pieces back in okay so now i smell a very nice toasted 
earthy flavor from the walnuts. And I'm going to put back in my chicken pieces. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna put in my spices first so I can mix them and then my chicken pieces. So let's put in our paprikas. Okay, make sure you get all of it out of there. And I'm on the medium heat so I don't burn. My second paprika, the smoked, the salt. Oh, one thing I should mention about salt, if you're using kosher meat, kosher meat tends to be saltier than a non-kosher meat. So you might want to use a little bit less than what I say, or you might want to um, wait to taste it to see how much salt it needs, okay? So if my recipe calls for um, one to one and a quarter, you might want to start with half a teaspoon instead of one and a quarter teaspoon and then uh, wait till you taste it after it's been cooking a little bit with the sauce. That's just one thing I think you should always keep in mind whenever you read a recipe if you're using kosher meat. Okay, so I just added both paprikas, I added the, the cinnamon, and now I'm adding the pepper, and I added the salt, and I'm holding on to my brown sugar, okay? I'm just gonna mix that up, and now I'm going to put back in my chicken pieces. Um, oh, you know what I forgot to tell you to do, but let's do that now. Make sure your temperature is on low, okay? For the uh, nuts, so it doesn't burn. And right now, let us dissolve this tomato paste in the cold water, okay? It makes it easier to add than putting it in there um, straight, okay? So I always, if I have tomato paste and I'm adding water, I always try to dissolve that first. So I have like a little bit of a tomato juice kind of thing going on here. If you're allergic or you don't eat the tomatoes, then you just leave this out. But you probably have to compensate, getting back to that question, compensate with um, uh, water, with liquid, okay? So you have at least that much additional liquid. And now, make sure you can see what's going on. I'm going to pour that in here, okay? So now we have the tomato liquid in there, the tomato juice. So if you're not using tomato, use water for that. And then I'm going to add um, the uh, pomegranate juice. So now you start to see really the base of the sauce that you're going to be cooking your chicken in. And then of course, my lime juice. If you don't have limes, you can use lemons. Limes have a little bit of a different flavor. Um, and limes are actually used a lot in Persian cooking, which is very interesting. Whereas in Syrian, I, I'm more familiar with uh, lemon juice, a lot of lemon juice. But in, in Iran, they use a lot of lime juice. And you know, Persian limes are famous in Iran. They're the little dried limes that they use to cook in stews and so on. So. Um, I used a lot of limes. Okay, so now um, because I added the liquid, I am raising the temperature back up, okay? Because every time you add something, it brings the temperature down. So now I'm back up to a medium high because I do want to bring this to a boil, okay? So bring this to a boil and then we can add our chicken pieces to stew. And if you have the coriander leaves that you want to add to the, um, to the stew, I like to cook some inside the stew and I like to uh, serve it that way. So now I'm just going to sprinkle them in, okay? Mix that. And before I add my chicken, I think what I'm gonna do is put in my brown sugar. If you're not sure, you can add half the amount. Um, what I ask for is one and a half to two tablespoons. So, and especially if you're not using pomegranate juice um, and using like cranberry, like I mentioned, or different juice, then you don't, do want to taste it. So now I just mixed in the sugar and um, put in more. Okay, so now that's all in there. So everything should be in the stew now. We're waiting for it to come to a boil. And the only thing that's not in there is the chicken itself, okay? So once that comes to a boil, we can add our chicken pieces to stew in the uh, sauce. If you wanted to taste it before 
you put in the chicken, you can do that. But keep in mind that the sauce flavor will not be there quite yet because it will be a little thin. It does not have the chicken flavor cooking in and they haven't met, the flavor hasn't melded together. So I just tasted mine and it's a bit sour, but in a good way, but it's a little thin because it hasn't cooked down yet, which is normal, okay? So now, while I'm waiting for this to come to a boil, this is a good time if people have any other questions to ask me about anything, whether it's this dish or how to serve it. Um, I can mention how to serve it. Certainly rice is very, is one of the most popular things in Iran. They're known for their rice dishes, but you don't have to do a big fancy rice dish. You can just do a long grain white rice. Uh, I like to do rice with turmeric in it. So it's like a yellow rice with onions. Um, maybe you can throw in cinnamon sticks and cloves, things like that. In Iraqi cooking, they do that a lot too. So I'm used to sort of whatever I have, uh, kind of sp whole spices, I'll throw in maybe some crushed cardamom pods, things like that. And then it's nice because you have a quick rice that, that is special and goes really well with this dish. Um, but rice really is the best, uh, I would say, grain or starch to serve with, um, with the stew. And I just want to show you right now, because it is boiling, now it's coming to a boil. Okay, so now is the perfect time for me to return my chicken pieces, and I'm just going to put them, the big pieces down first. And you know what, I think I'm actually going to cut some of these pieces down, because they're a little big. I'll put in the, the um, drumsticks first, okay? You see they're kind of cooking in the, this. I'm going to cut this piece down a little bit. This is a nice bite size. Not bite size, but portion size, right? And this one, I don't know. Sometimes the, these chicken breasts are just way too big. Cut this one. So Jennifer, okay. we did have a bunch of questions coming in, but I'll here, I'll just throw my own in. So when you're cooking your chicken in the sauce now, do you want it to be, the, the chicken's gonna be completely submerged in that sauce? It doesn't have to be completely submerged because okay. there's more than enough, if you look here, there's more than enough liquid while it's not completely submerged, um, there's more than enough for the chicken to cook into and when the ch as the chicken cooks, it also releases juices from from the meat, right? So you'll end up with more liquid. Um, the other thing is you don't want so much liquid that uh, you're waiting for it to cook down because you do want to reduce it a little bit. It's sort of you're trying to reduce it um, to get a bit of a gravy and a full flavor, but you don't want it to be a soup, right? It's still a stew. And also just so you know, I'm gonna reduce my temperature now because once I add the chicken, if it's still, it, and it comes to another second boil, right? Cause it's boiling before we put it in. And once it starts boiling again, you can reduce, reduce it low enough as long as there's activity in the pot. Like you still see in the center, if I think it's, uh, there's no activity, it's not bubbling in the center, I'll, I will increase the heat. You have to use you know, your own sense of um, looking, watching your stove everybody has a different stove you might have um i have gas some people have electric some some people's stoves maybe uh get hotter faster or keep in mind if you put your pot on a bigger flame um on a larger part of your uh, stove it's going to be more powerful right so the main thing to look for is this bubbling so it's simmering and right now i have it on a low, not all the way low, but on low, okay? Are and I'm going to let this simmer. Does this cook covered or uncovered? So what I would do is um, I would cook it for 20 minutes partially covered like this so that a little bit of the steam comes out, but not completely. And then after you cook this for about um, 20 minutes over medium low heat, then you'll reduce, mm -hmm. you'll remove the lid and you'll continue to cook until it thickens into a gravy and it could be another 45 minutes. 
So, so you're talking about an hour's worth of cooking once everything is together in the pot, um, about 15, 20 minutes without, but like partially covered, and then about 40, 45 minutes uncovered. Okay. But then you have to reduce the heat because you don't want it, you don't want it boiling over so that all the liquid cooks off completely too early, right? You want it to slowly simmer so that the liquid the vapor, you know, the, um, the liquid cooks off slowly, but also gives it time for the flavors to come together, the gravy to thicken, and you want that flavor from the chicken. Um, this is a poultry dish, originally duck, also chicken. And so you want that chicken flavor to come together. And then what you'll end up with is a sauce where um, you may not be able to necessarily determine exactly all the, the ingredients that went into it. You'll know that it's a little fruity. You'll know that it's a little uh, a sour and tart. Um, oh, I wanted to mention before I forgot, <clears throat> this is pomegranate syrup, which is also used in a lot of Persian cooking, also Iraqi cooking. Um, actually, the Syrians, we use a fruit type thing too for our stews, but we use tamarind. It's just a little bit different. But this is a little sweeter. There are some, I've, I've read some Fessin John, Fessin June recipes that people use actually pomegranate concentrate or syrup, but don't, whatever you do, you're not going to directly substitute this for the juice because this is concentrated, right? So if you do use this, then you'll have to kind of create your own uh, balance of flavor with liquid, water, tomato, and so on, okay? Any other questions? So here's some more questions. Could you make Great. this in an instant pot? Oh, um, I don't cook much in instant pots. I'm always doing slow cooking on the stove, but I know a lot of people do on instant pots. So what I would say is, um, from my understanding with this instant pot is that it's like a very controlled, even temperature that, that maintains itself. So <clears throat> my guess is, I mean, you, it would be great if you can still sear, which I think you can do, sear your yeah. chicken a little bit before, and then put it into the instant pot, like I did with the pot with the liquid and the spices and the juices and all that. Um, I guess the onions you can just put into your Instant Pot if you don't want to cook them ahead of time, because that's the whole point, right? You put it all in and then you just cover, set your timer. So I would say that you could set your timer for um, 45 minutes and see how it is. The only thing I'm not sure about is how that works in an Instant Pot if you need liquid to cook off. Right, right. The liquid part is the, I think the trickier part. So I would say if you're experienced in Instant Pot and you know how much liquid, what the ratio is, then you could experiment um, um, with this. Or also you could Google another Fezenjan, um recipe and see if there is one already for an Instant Pot. I'm sure somebody, some very smart Persian um, cook has, has maybe thought of this. Some other questions are, um, some suggestions for a vegetarian version of this. And also if you would, if there's a suggestion of, an, of a vegetable side dish you would serve alongside this. Okay, so um, vegetable side dish, hmm. I mean, you know, you could serve it with steamed greens um, because it has a lot of sauce, it would go well and then it would be simple. Uh, like broccoli, string beans, I think would go really well because off the top of my head, it reminds me of um, a green a green bean dish that we cook Syrian and Persians too, I think with tomatoes and it also can have a sour sweet flavor. So string beans might work really well. Um, and I would say, you know, sometimes, uh, Sometimes in the Fesinjan, I read that one traditional way, which surprised me, was with eggplant. So mm. if you like eggplant, you could actually do the Fesinjan where the eggplant is cooked in the stew. Um, the only thing is you really have to be careful about eggplant because it has to be cooked really, really well and has to, to lose that sponginess 
or then it's not really edible. So uh, you might have to cook, I'm not sure if that's something you have to pre-cook in oil a little bit first, and then you cook, but I can see that being really good and I wouldn't mind myself trying that version with eggplant in it. And maybe that can be your substitute because a lot of times vegetarians will use eggplant in certain cases in place of meat. Uh, that could be your vegetarian version with the sauce and the flavor. You won't have the, one idea is you don't have necessarily the um, flavor of the juices from the chicken, but you can buy um, broth that is no chicken chicken broth. And maybe it has some flavors that it's like a rich flavored kind of uh, bouillon or um, that doesn't have meat in it. And that could help with the flavor of the sauce part. It's and then you can leave that. And I'm not sure about tofu and all that, that meatless stuff. That to me, you would have to either A, like it, <laughs> and then incorporate it into your dish. Uh, and if it works, because I did also notice that there were recipes that said you can use ground meat. So if you wanted to use one of these meat substitute, no non-beef, beef substitutes and cook that in place of the chicken, pre-cook it like, you know, fully ground and then add your uh, sauce. But keep in mind, everything is always going to change. The texture will never be exactly the same. But if you like it, that's all that matters, right? Doesn't matter anything else. Another question that came up a couple of times is, could you use like a, uh, like a stevia or another sugar substitute in place of the brown sugar? Um, you can use, if you don't want to use sugar, sugar, like uh, if you don't want to use brown sugar, um, you can use the agave nectar because it's pretty neutral in flavor. Um, if, if it tastes fine to you without any sugar added, and you can do that too. It just usually the pomegranate juice sometimes is a little bit, little too on the tart side. So you need something to kind of round out the flavor. Um, but if you want to leave it out completely and it tastes fine to you, you can do that. And if not, then you can try the agave um, syrup nectar. Uh, you don't want to use something like maple syrup. As much as I love maple syrup, everything tastes like pancakes. So you don't want to do that. Um, if there's an unprocessed other type of sugar, you can do that. Oh, and the stevia, I guess it's somebody who doesn't want to add sugar. The only thing is you have the natural sugar and pomegranate syrup, uh, juice. So if that's okay for you, then maybe you can add another type of sugar that's, um, it's not a lot of sugar. So you can add just a little bit. You can do the stevia too, if it's fine for you. Just the proportions are totally different. I think you use very, very little when it comes to that kind of stuff. So we have a couple, a couple of people asking about, could you use honey? Could you use um, Ceylon, which is, you know, date syrup? Oh, um, Ceylon. Yeah, you would say yeah. Um, I think if you do use a honey, make sure you use a really mild clover type of honey. Um, Honey also can have a very strong flavor. Again, you won't need the same proportion because when it's a syrup consistency, it's pretty concentrated. So you may not need more than a couple of teaspoons. Um, the Ceylon is an interesting idea. I like that idea because you're, it's sort of like you're already in the fruit uh, sweetener category and that is coming from that region, right? Ceylon is an Iraqi, an ancient Iraqi um, natural, like homemade syrup made with dates. And I can see that actually working very well as a substitute for a sweetener and just do it to taste. So I just wanna share that um, Alan and Michelle she, I said, I'm cooking along and my kitchen smells wonderful. Great, thank you. No surprise. Yes, glad to hear that some people are cooking along. Uh, and also, you know, if it's late for you and you're not eating, like I'm not gonna be eating my, my chicken tonight because it's, uh, it's almost 8.30, but I'm saving it for tomorrow. And it probably, it might even taste better tomorrow because a lot of times this kind of cooking, it needs time to kind of sit 
and marinate, you know? So it's probably going to be even better tomorrow. And you just reheat it either um, on the stove top or in your microwave, if you don't mind using a microwave, um, just reheating it. Um, just be careful you, when you reheat on the stove that you don't end up cooking it. You, you cook it just long enough to heat, not that you're cooking it more again, because it will, will have cooked plenty uh, before. If somebody only has pomegranate molasses, um, how, could, how would they incorporate it? Like what would be the proportion in this recipe if they don't have pomegranate? you uh I'm not off the top of my head sure what the proportion would be but go what buy, I buy pomegranate juice it's like at every supermarket that's what i would yeah say. you could get pomegranate juice but if you wanted to use the syrup you would have to dilute it in the cold water that i had because let's see i'm using a cup of cold water that was used for the tomato paste so what i would do is i would I would mix it in with your tomato paste in the cold water um, and taste it and just make sure you don't get a super syrupy sweet um, flavor. Remember when you pour it into the stew then it's going to be diluted again because it's cooking with the chicken and whatever. So you might have to wait to add, if you're not adding the juice, you might have to wait to add the, uh, the syrup uh, until everything's cooked a little bit together. But remember, uh, the juice is liquid. So you're not just substituting this and leaving out the juice without remembering to put back the one and a quarter cups of water in there. So, Let's see, I'm going to, uh, just a one second before I take another uh, question, I'm yeah, showing you okay. how my chicken looks now. Um, I'm going to raise the temperature just a tiny bit but it is bubbling, that's just what you want. And you can see the colors changing a little bit, which is good, it's, beco it's coming, becoming like a, like a richer reddish brown gravy color. And you can see that it's cooked down by the edge looking around your pot. You see it's on mine, it's cooked down by about half an inch. That's good. I'm gonna be setting my timer now for 45 minutes. But what you can do is set it for 30 and check in 30 and then add 15. You know, I always say it's good, especially if you haven't done a dish before, to set your timer a little bit earlier than a recipe uh, asked for because there's so many differences that could happen in your um, cooking, right? With the temperature, the heat, the size of the pot, and so on. But this is definitely coming together. And if you were to taste it now, and compare it to what it was before, you can even see, you can even see, uh, let's see, can you see there? It's thickening, okay? It's not as watery and thin, just visually. And then if you wanna taste it, just sort of make sure you mix it a little bit before you take off the top, because that's where the, the fat will rise to the top and you won't really taste the true flavor. And But you can do sort of an in-between taste now. Yeah, it's definitely coming together. I would say it's still a little thin, but it's definitely better than it was about 15 minutes ago. Okay, next question. All right, so I'm just gonna say, guys, like let's focus here. Are there any non-substitute questions? I'm happy to, I'm happy to share any <laughs> non-substitute questions. We're here tonight to learn about this very quintessential um, Persian dish, right? It's very classic, it's beloved. My Persian friends, is just, it's such comfort food. So if there are any non-substitute questions, I'm happy to field them over to, to Jennifer. Okay, so um, ask away. Um, and I, just to repeat what somebody said, why wouldn't you brown the chicken first? She did brown the chicken first. And then it's going to cook right. You said 20 minutes is going to be over medium simmer with the cover off. And then for what the last 20 minutes is going to be covered at a lower temperature. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. So now it's uncovered. I had covered it uh, initially and now I have uh, uncovered it. And this process is the uncovering is now, you, and you can see you were asking me, um, Shannon, before about 
is it almost like it wasn't enough liquid, it didn't look submerged enough. You can see that the chicken, it almost looks like now it is lower in the sauce, but that's because we were cooking it with the cover on and the liquid was sort of um, coming out of the uh, chicken, right? So now we have all this and that gives the flavor in the sauce. So now we want to do, what we want to do is cook it off. We want to cook it off um, so that the liquid becomes thicker, more like a gravy, and then you're still pulling out more and more flavor from the meat itself into the sauce. All right, so we have some non-substitute questions. Congratulations, everybody, for getting yourselves together. All right, so uh, I thought this was an interesting question because I find in a lot of Italian cooking, you know, my mom's Italian, that you do, you, you toast the tomato paste when you're adding it to a dish and then you add everything else. So somebody asked why we would add the, the tomato paste to the water instead of adding it when you were doing the onions. Okay. Uh, the reason I dissolve the tomato paste in the liquid is because it makes it easier to add it. It's, it's incorporated because it's going to be part of the base of the sauce, right? And the tomato paste is concentrated and very thick. So I dilute it in the liquid and then I can pour it directly into the, um, the pot and it's already sort of with the water. It could have been even diluted in the juice. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. I could have combined the juice. I could have combined all the liquid in a big measuring. I like to use the glass measuring cups because you can mix and measure and pour in. But I could have combined the lime juice, the, the pomegranate juice, the tomato paste and the water and then poured it all in. The reason um, I found, now if you had put the tomato paste in and you forgot or you decided not to, that would have been fine too. But remember at the time that I was pouring it in, there was no liquid in there. It was very dry. So if you'd put the tomato paste in first, it would have been even more dry. And, and I didn't want things to burn in the pot. So that's why I dissolve it, liquid, and then pour. It just makes it, it just makes more sense to do it that way. All right, we had a lot, a lot more questions coming. We have a burning question about turmeric. You mentioned putting turmeric in the rice, and this person wants to know um, if you turmeric has a bitter taste to it. I actually doesn't have a bitter taste to me, but if you find the taste of turmeric bitter, like what would you do to balance out the bitterness if you add turmeric to the rice? And then, well, and, should, and then yeah. somebody wants to know, of course, because how could we forget this question? How do you what the substitute? This? No, no, no. <laughs> how do you freeze oh, oh. this? <laughs> oh, the chicken? Yes. Or how do you freeze okay, the chicken? Okay, so, so the turmeric, um, it does have a strong flavor. Um, it can be bitter, but not if you don't use too much of it. Um, if you use very little, it will be a very, very pale yellow, and you'll practically not even maybe taste it, and it will be more like for color, and especially if there's other spices and flavors. You may not know. Um, like if turmeric is also in a lot of curry mixes. So when you buy curry, like powder, um, not everybody always knows that the curry is not just a curry leaf, but a lot of times also with turmeric and other spices in there, just like when you buy za'atar, you're not necessarily buying just za'atar, the herb, you're buying a blend with the za'atar in it. So if you feel like it's too strong for you, then just put less turmeric, or you can put in some of the whole um, uh, spices that I mentioned, like cloves and cardamom and uh, pods and things like that and cinnamon stick, and then it will bring all the flavor together and it will be very aromatic in addition to looking very pretty. But you also don't have to do it. You can do it with just a simple long grain rice steamed and with onions or not onions or whatever. It's just that it goes really well with rice. You could also do with quinoa. If you like quinoa and you don't want uh, rice, you can do with quinoa, uh, serve it with that. Bulgur, if you like bulgur and you know how to make a bulgur peel off and how to do that, you can do with that too. Um, and you could do with potatoes. Like if you like potatoes, it goes really well because the Persians, they also do a uh, tazig um, with potatoes that uses turmeric. So you could do just potatoes and serve the sauce and the chicken with that. In terms of freezing, whenever you make any of this, you should always make sure that you, um, you fully cool anything before you put it in a container and seal it. 
That's one basic rule. Um, so that's the first thing. And I would say it freezes pretty well, um, this particular chicken uh, dish. It freezes pretty well. Um, the texture might be off a little bit, um, just because sometimes the sauce, something happens when you freeze things. Um, but it's still, I think it, it, in, in the world of like chicken stews that I've made and frozen, this one freezes pretty well. All right, another question, and, and this one has, I think an interesting story. Someone asked why you don't, you didn't use garlic in the sauce. Um, as, and there's a tradition of not using onion and garlic together in some Middle Eastern Jewish cooking, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I can't say for sure that you wouldn't find one, a recipe with garlic in it. It's not so much that you're not allowed and it's, it's just not what you do, but it's just also not necessarily what you do always, right? There are some dishes that use garlic and don't use onion. We just tend to, um, in certain kinds of cooking, like Italian, maybe certain regions of, Ital of Italy, and not necessarily all of Italy, I don't know. I know that in Syria, in Aleppo, where my family comes from, in the north, northern part of Syria, they do more of dishes like this, where you have sweet and savory fruit and meat together. And maybe they were influenced by the Persian Empire, and that's how they got that. Whereas if you go to uh, Damascus, they're much more with lots of garlic and onion flavoring and not the fruit sweet thing. Um, so it's also uh, just some countries, but also not just the cuisine entirely. Sometimes certain regions tend to use one or the other or both. You could find that green onions might be used. I know that in Ethiopia, um, they use a lot of red onions actually. Whereas we're used to in the US, just red onion, maybe a lot of times it's like in a salad, the occasional salad. Uh, and then we just tend to use mostly just yellow onions for things. Um, but some cu uh, cultures, they use all different kinds of onion and garlic. Um, so it's not so much that you can't, it's just that I don't have it in this particular a recipe, but you could add it if you wanted to. And then there might be a tradition, and this is a whole other thing that's not necessarily for this recipe, but if there was a tra tradition to possibly leave garlic, and this is how, because of what I do when I do research about traditions, um, I would look into whether if, because this is used for a certain uh, celebration, if there are different uh, traditions during holidays, just like in the tra Jewish tradition during Rosh Hashanah, uh, where you tend to serve things where they're plentiful and small and round to represent abundance, sweet things, that it's a sweet New Year's, that sim symbolism, there could be a possibility, but I don't know. I would. This is what I would look into, um, of garlic in certain cases at certain occasions not being used for a certain reason. Because I know in Passover, some people I interviewed for my Too Good to Passover cookbook told me that in some rare cases during Passover, for some reason, they, their mother would never use garlic in cooking because it was bitter. Or during Rosh Hashanah, maybe not. So it can, it can really vary. Someone yeah. else asked if you could talk a little bit about tadik and making tadik and what, is, what it entails. <clears throat> so tadik is a real skill. Um, an art form in a way. The tadig, for people who don't know what that is, that is the crust that you get at the bottom of a pot, usually with rice, although tadig can be made also with potatoes, thinly sliced potatoes. <clears throat> so it's basically a crust that you make and you uh, create at the bottom of a pot, and then you build either your rice on top of that or your casserole um, on top of that. And then the idea is that <clears throat> you can either invert it so you end up almost like a cake looking type of shape where the tadig that was on the bottom becomes the top of the cake. And it's very crispy and browned and looks really nice. And in Persian and um, uh, families in particular, they grow up with that. So that is considered like the, the, mo the, the most coveted um, special part of the rice or the dish. And they will either cut it up and serve it separately, um, or if it falls, if it crumbles and falls apart, you can serve it separately. And then the rice part 
separately and the tadig is in its own bowl and people will take the tadig and leave with the rice or they'll cut it into pieces if it holds together as a whole thing. Making it, I, it's very hard to even teach, let alone just explain to you, but I will say that <clears throat> the rice dishes are very involved. You use a long grain rice, you parboil it. Um, so there's several levels and phases to cooking the rice, and then you kind of put it and return it to the pot, but you have to create your tadig in the oil almost first, and then you add, and then you cook it. And sometimes tadig is with dairy, and it's made with yogurt mixed in with the vegetables first and then built on top and then steamed and cooked. So that's sort of the biggest answer I can give. And then when they serve it, uh, the really fancy ones, maybe not the everyday tadig or even a Shabbat tadig, but like in a special occasion like a wedding, you might have it tiered with fruit and meat and shaved um, separately cooked carrots, uh, herbs, there's also the herb tadig. I've made it, uh, I make a tadig that's with like five herbs and then the lettuce on the bottom of the pot. Um, they're very big with herbs in uh, Persian cooking too. Many, many, many greens and herbs, melons, fruits, and they have really a lot uh, of natural native ingredients to use. It's probably, I think, one of the most um, developed cuisines in the East, I think. Thanks, that was um, really helpful. So we're, we're, we're just about at one hour, so I wanna give, if there's any last questions, speak now or forever hold your peace, or at least until next week when we join again. Um, if you are making the pheasant please feel free to share pictures of the beautiful chicken in our Facebook group. It's called the Nosher Cooking and Baking Group or on Instagram. We love to see when you guys are baking and cooking along with us. Please, please share them. Um, Jennifer, I wanna thank you so much and give you a last minute to, to share what your chicken is looking like. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to bring it to in front of me, take it off the heat for a split second, just so you can get a really good overhead view. Okay. So this is what my chicken looks like now. Okay. And you can see um, when you would serve it, you can serve it in a platter, it has to be not a shallow platter because it's pretty saucy, but you can serve it on a platter um, or in a nice decorative bowl. Um, but it's nice to sprinkle some extra either parsley leaves or coriander leaves on top just to make it look fresh and green um, and have the color, it, the contrast of the green with the red looks very nice. And then if you were to serve this and then the rice on the side or a grain or quinoa or whatever it is that you want to do or potatoes, then you have a full meal and then you could have um, your, if you wanted to add a vegetable, you could have your string beans, you can have your broccoli, Brussels sprouts even, I really think any kind of steamed or even sauteed or roasted uh, vegetable would go really well, even carrots, something like that. Um, and this is, you know, a great Shabbat dish. Um, this is a great dish um, for the winter, as I mentioned, it was, it's one of the traditions is actually at the end of December, so you could do it um, during the holidays. And, um, you know, and it can be in the fall, you know, so it's kind of all year round. You can do it all kinds of different times. Jennifer, thank you so, so, so much. So everyone, I want to thank you guys for joining us. There were so many nice comments saying thank you for the class. I learned so much. It was so educational. So if you enjoyed it, we hope we'll see you again next Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, same time, same place, with Jennifer learning how to make, what are we making next week? Next week, we're doing the Greek Sephardic cooking. We're getting into the Sephardic world, and we're going to do these um, spinach uh, cheese fritters. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to do a tzatziki type of uh, homemade tzatziki yogurt kind of sauce to go with that. Awesome. I'm excited. I can't wait to make this for my husband. He loves this dish. 
I've never, I've always been nervous to make it, but now I'm, I'm going to do it. So. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you for joining. Good night. See you next week. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Good night, everybody. Good night.